Surprise, he lives very quietly in downtown Toronto, and you may not have ever heard of him, but you will know him after our conversation with Richard Allen. story I heard some years ago, I don't know whether it was true or not, was like this. Apparently, Canada House in London was hosting a Canada Culture Week of some kind, and all our big name literary talents were there, including Irving Lincoln, the roaring boy poet from Montreal, who was standing off to the side nursing a drink, when a woman came over to him and said, who are you? And he replied, Irving Lincoln from Canada. The woman replied, oh, then you must know Richard Elson, Canada's greatest poet. <laughs> this we does not record Mr. Layton's response. <laughs> Richard Elson has been writing poetry for about 40 years. He has published many not-so-slim volumes of verse. He's probably written more than a thousand poems and has been called one of the finest poets in the English language. In fact, all his reviews are raised. Yet he has never received a Canada Council grant, is not included in most Canadian anthologies, has not been invited to join the Canadian League of Poets, and has only received one award so far, the Toronto Book Award for his poems, Benedict Broad. Through most of his writing life, he has also held a job in the CBC Scenic Design Department. He writes about, well, just about everything. God, Popeye, Beethoven, love, Dr. Doolittle, nature, light, death, even some like so. I think you get the picture. His poems are not exactly easy. They are challenging. And for the most part, though, pretty clear. I'm delighted to have Richard Elgrim with me in the students' morning. Good morning. Good morning, Michael. Isn't the true story about the Irving Lake encounter in Canada Cup or did someone make that up? I wouldn't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't invited to the party. <laughs> no, that wasn't that part. I love the story. And I, and I, I hope it is true. I'm sure. I'm sure it was. I'd like to think it was true. I haven't known quite what so Leighton's regarding might have been, but I suspect it would have been. Huh? <laughs> All of the four years you've been the writer, at least, at least, at the same time working somewhere in the bowels of the basement of the CBC. So the bowels and the top of the CBC have a curious similarity a lot of the time, but the bowels is probably the uh, descriptive. Doing more of working in the scenic, what is that? It's a television with the <coughs> scenery thing? Scenery and many things. Uh, Making it, painting it? Uh, no, no, I was a stagehand crew leader, which meant that I moved the men who, however reluctantly, moved the scenery. <laughs> when did you write? In the morning or on your coffee break? Or? The writing is a relatively small part of the actual vocation. Uh, reading and thinking, actually, are dominant. So that finding time to write is not really a problem. It's finding time to read, to think. Uh, the nature of the business was such that there were long periods of hanging around. And I was able to train myself, really, to do a lot of reading and thinking at corporation expense. No doubt in high-powered meetings. I was in hundreds and hundreds of meetings, but I don't remember a high-powered one. But the numbers were very funny indeed. You can go to any library in the industry of the morgue and pick up thick folders of profiles and stories and reviews about poets that, that I've never heard of, never hear of again. Yet it's very hard to find material on Richard Altrum. Are you, are you something of a, of a hermit or, or a, a recluse? No, I'm kind of no, kind of airline. It's something that I um, so much admire in Northrop Fry, for instance, who said, uh, and one thinks of his prodigious achievements, how he had carefully arranged his life so that nothing had ever happened to him. A wonderful quote. But really, nothing much has ever happened to me, except, as 
absolutely monumental and wonderful things in terms of language and uh, also reflection, and uh, my two loves. So you don't feel the neglected poet, the poet in the gallery, the ignored by the universe. You don't feel it was cast away. Well, you see, I don't think that the front of the literary world is the universe. It's strange as this may sound. Too long. Okay, too okay, Mr. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I am so enormously grateful for having been enabled and empowered to do what I have done and write what I have managed to write and um, sustain myself and my wife, uh, the distinguished painter Barbara Howard. Yeah. And uh, no one has ever shot at me. I've never been really hungry. I've never been tortured. I've never been imprisoned. I've lived in free, relatively free, relatively sane society. I mean, my God, how ungrateful could one be if one simply uh, then started to bitch about lack of public response? There is a, a, a rumor, a myth going around, that we live uh, on the verge of a literary community of some kind that is both all-powerful and incestuous and uh, all of that, but you're not a member of that August <coughs> body. You don't turn up at the Council of Harmonies and, and the readings and things. No, and there are uh, practical reasons for that. If you remember the early days of CDC, I joined CDC in 53, for heaven's sake, we worked a 24-hour day, seven days a week, and it was impossible in the stage crew to um, schedule anything so that you couldn't join any organization, make reservations, plan on parties. And the problem in the corporation itself was that it became a complete and, to some degree, satisfying world for so many people who worked within the corporation. Well, it was a wonderful time. And it was a wonderful time. Norman Jewish did an art killer, and all those people were here. You know, the former marvelous name. Yeah. But it did mean that your life outside the corporation suffered enormously. So that's certainly one practical reason. But the other one, I suppose, was that I really didn't have the time. I think we should give the listeners a chance to hear a sample of one of your poems before we rattle on too much more about the CDC or anything else. Would you mind reading something for me? I'd be delighted. And then, for heaven's sake, let's stop talking about the corporation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Read through a poem called Stage Group. All right, and, and, then we'll, and then we'll move on. I will say, before I read this, that the disrepair of the corporation disturbs me thoroughly. One, and only one of the reasons why I came to the CDC and why I stayed as long as I did was because of my profound respect for and belief in the importance of public service broadcasting. And I've seen it, well, I vanish in my time. It was a terrible thing to have happened. But I'm sure we're not alone in our sentiment. Mm -hmm. This was written in 1962 and addressed to a friend who'd left the crew some time before. It remained unpublished for a number of years until 1990, when it first appeared. It's been published in a collected form now, but it first appeared in Take One, a CBC in-house publication back in 90. Stage crew. Remember how, with those reluctant gangs of punks and drunks and athletes in blue jeans and brittle British thespians and thugs and innocents and sobs and ex-marines, we filled the slipshod nights by daft degrees with intricate, fantastical machines to hold a gimcrack mirror up to art. Oh, darkly, darkly, honest souls asleep, dreamless we watched the painted cities rise, the canvas worlds collapsed into a heap. A house of cards, a rhythmless quick flux that might make Joe or Herotitus weep, contained us handsomely. What could we learn coming to grips, you will forgive the pun, with that menage those dear, wild, bootless men as best we could? When all was said and done, they were the stuff, the burden of the love that we had need to find. As, one by one, they pass like ribald mummers through the mind. I find for each his legend and event. Stephen, who throws his penis in the Alps. Or Pat, who burned his captain in his tent. Or Vernon, who had slept with ruby queens. An endless, ragged mask. 
They came and went from slums or public schools or prison camps to Tullys or Bermudas or disgrace. But for a spell who worked and cursed and fought and laughed with them, they were that lovely race wherein we learn to watch for God's delight framed pityingly within a human face. Richard Altrin. <laughs>